My name is Deanna Erickson. My name is Deanna Erickson, and I am the director at the Lake Superior National Estuarine Research Reserve in, in Superior, Wisconsin. We work on the St. Louis River. We do research, education, outreach, and stewardship there. And this program is offered with our good friends and partners at Wisconsin Sea Grant. This is part of a, a monthly series called the River Talks, and it's a really special River Talk because it's being held in conjunction with the St. Louis River Summit, which is a multi-day gathering of a couple hundred people who work and research and learn along the St. Louis River. So really happy to have everyone here. Um, so uh, we also have sponsors tonight. Um, I don't have the sponsors in my notes, but I know one of them is the Duluth Pottery and Tile Company and or Poetry. Um, Ryan, you don't happen to have that other sponsor available, do you? It's oh, it's yeah. the Isaac Isaac Walton. Isaac Walton League. Thank you so much. So that's the sponsors for the program this evening. Um, so we had a crazy idea to uh, search for poems about rivers and have poets share them. And when we planned this, we imagined maybe getting a few poems, or at least I did. And uh, Actually, what happened is we we got 189, I'm hoping I got the number right, poems um, from all over the country and around the world. Thank you for sharing that link, Tom. Um, so it turns out a lot of people like to write about rivers and that's because they're really important in our, in our communities and in our lives. So we had a series of judges, many of them were um, uh, natural resource or researchers, scientists type folks, and the judging was blind. And the six judges were Nick Dons, Julie O'Leary, who's here tonight, Kari Hadeen, Russ Marin, Hannah Ramage, also here, Marie Zwickoff, who coordinated, largely coordinated this program. So uh, myself and uh, Marie and Ryan are your hosts this evening. And I think with that, we'll move to introducing poets and Marie is going to introduce the first poet of the evening. Thank you all for being here. Yeah, thank you. It's nice to see everybody. Um, our first poet is Tyler Detloff and Tyler is a musician and poet from the swampy delirium wilderness of Michigan's Upper Peninsula. His sophomore LP, Dynamite Honey, Northern Folk and Blues was released in November 2020 by Lost Dog Records. So he's a singer in addition to, uh, he's a musician in addition to being a poet. And his first chapbook of poems, Belly Up Rose Hip, A Tongue Blue with Mud Songs was released in August, 2019 through Swimming with Elephants publications. Tyler teaches college composition and Native American literature at Lake Superior State University. Tyler performs as a one-man blues band and likes the smell of a bog before a thunderstorm. So Tyler, go ahead. Well, thank you for that introduction, miigwech. Um, Ani bojo. Um, hi, hello, my name's Tyler. I just said uh, hello to you and, and Anishinaabe Moan, I'm coming to you from Anishinaabe territory here in Bawating, Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan. Um, I'm at my office currently, but I wanna say thank you so much for having me be part of this program. And it's an honor to open up this poetry reading at the, uh, the conference. Um, I'm gonna get right into it because I think singing and speaking poems are much better than my extemporaneous attempts at bogging down my conversational skills. So uh, this is a poem called My Stars, um, Ni Nan Gokor. And that's, uh, that's a, it's a Anishinaabe, Moan language and English poem. Uh, so just give a little backstory about this. Uh, the poem came, uh, as some of you might be familiar with the, <clears throat> the phenomenon of living in the woodlands. You don't really get a clear view of the horizon or the stars unless you are around water. Uh, so this, this poem kind of came out of a few experiences seeking the Northern Lights 
Uh, I'd go down to the riverbanks and that's where I'd wait for hours and hours. And this song really helped me pass the time, whether there was Northern Lights or not. So uh, I'm kind of gifting it to all of you as well. So feel free to sing it whenever you want. Uh, it's a poem and a song. So I'll kind of move back and forth between English language speaking, English lang language singing, and some Anishinaabe Moan um, speaking as well. My stars, Nina Ngoka. Tell me a story, oh, won't you, my stars? If not, then I'll listen for the morning. I'm down at the river, far past midnight. The waves, they crash hard, and I'm leaning in. And then this night is a howling without a moon. So I'm asking, tell me a story, oh, won't you, my stars? Debajimo daga nongoka, gipshkin, gawin, nando ta gishpep. Nin zibinong abitagi dipikad, maman gashka azwa kogabawi, noden gabi dipike, wawono oshkagojin, indawa jinin nadon. Down at the river, far past midnight, the waves they crash hard, now I'm three sheets to the wind, and this night is howling without a moon, I ain't asking. Tell me a story, oh, won't you, my stars? If not, I'll listen for the morning. Amigwetch. Thank you. Amigwetch. Thank you. All right. Our next poet. Oh, we have to do a little icon applause. That's true. Um, <laughs> Heather Dobbins is a native of Memphis, Tennessee. She is the author of two poetry collections in the Low Houses and River Mouth, both from Kelsey Press. She graduated from the College Scholars Program at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. She earned an MFA from the Graduate Writing Seminars at Bennington College. Her poems and poetry reviews have been published in Beloit Poetry Journal, Big Muddy, The Rumpus, Tri-Quarterly Review, and Women's Studies Quarterly, among others. For 20 years, she has worked as an educator, kindergarten through college in Oakland, California, Memphis, Tennessee, and currently Fort Smith, Arkansas. Heather. Well, thank you again for bringing us all here together tonight. Um, the poem I'm gonna read to you is a persona poem. I love to do research about uh, the flooding, the excessive flooding that has happened in my hometown of Memphis. So this um, poem was taken from a little snippet of a, of a story that I read about a, a woman who had survived uh, the flood by climbing a telephone pole and she kept her two children with her. So I thought the least I could do was to write her a poem. I held us on for 36 hours after the levee broke to hell. They were old enough to have muscle, no baby ankles or elbows. They knew how to climb, but it was still the hardest part. I was the only one in shoes. They could grip. I told them to reach up, then down, no splinter. They used my thighs as steps. I found near top steel spike underfoot. I sat facing each, them holding the foam pole, me holding both in frog legs. My husband was a builder, said a triangle is the strongest shape. I keep my feet wrapped around the pole, making a triangle with my legs, another with my arms. I beg, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Then I beg my husband, passed on a year, to help us, promise him I won't let ours go to him, that we won't all come now. They haven't married, loved like we did. After the first day, they do not cry my name, but daddy. My children say, you're sure stronger than you look. I say, strong isn't like the storybooks, but the parables. We watch the waters rise as the sun sets. Sun rises again and they cry out again. I've never seen this before. It's not right. Everything is covered. I count by pressing my fingers with each prayer. I don't tell them it helps my cramping these locking hands. We say each prayer a decade at a time. At the hour of our death, world without end, Holy Mother, 
I knew my hands would not fail me, but water eating away at our seat, sky not holding me like it never does. When they pulled me onto the boat, I did not care. Ma'am, my name is Leroy. See the boat below, you're safe. But he was wet. Safe is dry. Ma'am, your hands swole up. I'm here to get y'all down. Once he had them, I fell. His one eye green, the other blue, like my husband's. I knew I could let go. Thank you, Heather. And I was glad that it wasn't you <laughs> that actually got stuck up on the pool. But yeah, that is so powerful. Uh, our next reader is Benjamin Green. Ben is the author of 11 books, including The Sound of Fish Dreaming. At the age of 64, he hopes his new work articulates a mature vision of the world and does so with some integrity. Uh, ben resides in New Mexico. So Ben, you can unmute yourself. This is an honor to be part of a gathering of poets about rivers and water. Even though I live in New Mexico now, I wrote this poem when I lived in Northern California. And one piece of advice as I read it, sometimes when I write poems, I use parentheses so they can be read in multiple ways. I'm gonna only read this poem in one way. This is called Immersion, a Prayer of Intent. Winter has moods. Sometimes the blush of soft skin touching, sometimes the hiss and froth of mud in motion, sometimes the harsh, hard drought of thick stone. Rivers change shape, exploiting the simple extravagance of movement to become litanies of ripple, dance of push, curl, swirl. Streams shallow and deepen. Reflection and darkness compose poems of layered meaning. Creeks make songs, gifting music, sheens of mirrored glass, jazz of beating light, rhythms of a fluttering heart, soothing sounds of love. Water cradles the melody of grace joining together sacrament, renewal, reception, letting go. The shape of the earth is water falling, spilling, filling openings, asking strange questions never really answered. Water provokes considerations that last a lifetime. Wait long, think hard enough, find comfort in the mysteries, solace, drift, stream away, meander, descend, return, pass, be carried, be carried beyond into a current stronger, bigger, better. Water will not be held back, stand in a river, and be pushed down, grow old, and die. Yet you learn to love your life. Immerse yourself, follow the flow, it will bring you home. Thank you so much. Oh, that was wonderful. All right, our next poem is Granny Lammy and is a member and host of the Crazy Wisdom Poetry Circle who cherishes her Michigan and Montana connections. She is inspired by the works of Mary Oliver, Gerard Manley Hopkins, and all who enchant through spirit, presence, and rhyme. Her days are filled with words, ministry, and dog walking. 
having spent many years working in the University of Michigan Law School Admissions Office. Rainey. Thank you. Uh, thank you to all for uh, this wonderful evening. Uh, the poem was written this summer when I was home in Montana. I reside in Michigan and you know, I don't consider myself particularly, you know, I love words, but I read this article in the newspaper. It was a blip and I must've read it three times. And I thought, I understand every word that's used, but I have no idea what they're saying. And so it was out of that and the detail uh, that this poem arose. And in that sense, it's, it's lighter um, than some of uh, my fellow poets. And yet there was a particular poignancy for me in the care and detail and time that was taken in putting forth the content of this poem amidst this summer of uh, when we were struggling so much with how we value each other. So with that, uh, catching, catching your drift. On July 15th, 2020, a permanent hoot owl restriction for a portion of the lower Madison River has been implemented. The statement is as clear as the Montana sky and as colorfully murky as only bureaucraties can be. Invoking the lower Madison River must mean fishing Permanent is not the 24-7 forever injunction of American coastal culture. A permanent hoot owl restriction commands that each year for one month, July 15th through August 15th to be exact, when most probably the water is inches too low and slightly warmer than 73 degrees, there's no fishing from 2 p.m. to midnight because it is too stressful for the fish to fight for their lives in two different ways at once. Hoot owls and any kindred raptors are welcome anytime. Thank you. Thanks, Rainey. That was great. There's a lot of natural resource people in, in the audience, uh, so I think they can appreciate this. <laughs> uh, our next reader is Joan McIntosh, and she's coming to us uh, through a pre-recorded video because she lives in Newfoundland, and it's kind of late. It's kind of late in the evening there, um, so we'll be playing her video. But she lives in St. John's and writes poetry and pose. Her work has been published in Tickalace, NQ, Understory, and other publications. So Ryan, you wanna play Joan's video? The Current Fields by Joan McIntosh. On a quiet river, a man glides by, paddling a canoe. He dips his paddle tenderly, as though the current feels the thrust of the broad blade. I watch from the boathouse window, my body melting open as the canoe drifts by. He reaches for something unseen then bays his blade again. He glides by the boathouse window, paddling the river's lush darkness. It's really wonderful. Our next poet is Kate Meyer Curry. She's from Devon, England. I just want to check, Marie, is Kate in here? I don't know. Kate, are you there? <laughs> I'm 
might be missing one. She was like six out six hours ahead of us. <laughs> and I tried to help her figure out the time. It was one more person that just came in. I just want to check and make sure it's not Kate. <laughs> Sounds like it's not. All right, Maria, I think I'll pass it to you for the next one. Okay, I have Kate's poem. Oh, okay. And I can read it in her stead if we wanted to do that. Or we could wait till the end and see if she comes in. Yeah, let's wait till the end and then we'll do a check and we can take that one. All right. So our next poet is Rebecca Nelson. Uh, Rebecca is a PhD student at the University of California, Davis, studying restoration ecology. She has a BS with honors and distinction in ecology and evolution from Stanford, as well as minors in creative writing and science communication. As a Noah Hollings scholar, she worked at the Northwest Fisheries Science Center. She's from Illinois. Her poetry has appeared in the Eco Theory Review, the Weekly Avocet, and the Stanford Daily, and her first book of poems, Walking the Arroyo, is available on Amazon. Her writing has received a Scholastic National Art and Writing Awards gold medal and third place in the Stanford Planet Earth Arts Creating Writing Prize, Creative Writing Prize. Rebecca. Thank you so much for the introduction and for having me tonight. It's been an honor to present among so many talented poets. And I'd like to share a poem today I wrote about the St. Louis River um, and sort of inspired by sort of the spiritual and religious experiences I've had um, near rivers and, and watching water. Um, of the St. Louis River, as if known before birth and then forgotten, the river's music inherited in the Kingfisher's plunge Pines spire, their branches sling snow. I sit on a basalt slab and dream of glaciers heaving against land. Geese pump up from the bank. The afternoon sky floats down in brisk blue shards. Rapids glint, ice splinters. Before memory came lynx tracks in the snow and the wind changing. Rebecca, have you been here? <laughs> I actually have not. I would love to visit here sometime after the pandemic, but in writing this poem, did some research on the St. Louis River and had grown up in the Midwest and it reminded me a little bit of, of some of the rivers I experienced in, in my childhood. Really cool, thank you. All right, so Kate is here. And Can you see me? Um, I will, I will phone a friend. Oh, I'm wondering, hang on. Ah, that's it. Hang on. Me and Mr. Zoom. Right, there I am. Sorry, I've just been having some fun ah, with Mr. Zoom. Hiya. We've got you. <laughs> Despite Great, what okay. they say about the lockdown in the UK, I've avoided Zoom meetings so far. <laughs> so this is my first time. Your so. time has come. I'm going to read your intro and then I'll pass it over to you. Thank so. you. I apologize. It is 1.20 a.m. in the oh, UK. Goodness. So. Yeah. This is a uh, serious devotion to poetry. I appreciate, well, no, I appreciate you having me here. And it's my three days off from working on a psych ward. So if I look a bit, if I look a bit zoned out, it's, I apologize, but it was worth staying up to make sure make, make I could do it. Thank you very much for having me. <laughs> so Kate is from Devon, England. Uh, landscape, whether urban or rural, shapes her writing. Her varied career in a range of frontline settings has fueled an interest in gritty urbanism contrasted with her rural upbringing and which inspired the title of her forthcoming chapbook from Dancing Girl Press, County Lines, due out in 2021. Her poem, Family Landscape, Colchester, 1957, was published by Not Very Quite in September, 2020. Her ADHD also instills a sense of other in her life and writing, showing this reality and evoking unheard, unrepresented voices drives her urge to write. Yeah, many thanks for having me here in the UK. Um, 
the poem I'm going to read, um, I hope you'll listen rather than look at me because I've just looked at my reflection. I look hideous, but never mind. Um, it's a chartered account of a stream uh, near a family house that we had in a little place called Timberscombe up on Exmoor. I can wholeheartedly recommend a visit if you're ever in that part of the UK. It holds very strong family memories and associations and it's a place I, I love very much. And um, my writing has been exploring reminiscence and memory and connections with my, my father and my mum's family. Um, please bear with me while I just flip to my text because um, I'll be reading off my phone. And again, I apologize. Um, I'm short sighted and it's been a long few days. But anyway, this is Stream Timberscombe. Like a thread of memory, this quiet stream seems overlapping fields of time in valleys past. Its ripples are in the clear air, glimpsed through every morning's window. It flows at the lane's end where beaded houses are strung on the hillside swooping neck, where runoff tears of rain meet ochre earth. Puddles are open wounds red with lost time's blood. It is just a short walk for a child sturdy in Wellingtons, a mere hop, skip and jump to the low graveled margins where plaited weed floats under the aspic surface of standing water. Water boatmen row in slow motion under the stepping stone bridge, where caddis larvae lurk like trolls bedecked in costume jewelry that catches the light. A stone's throw, but a giant leap for tentative feet that trip like billy goats over the slimy rocks. Bare toes clenched, shocked by cold, with grit and pebbles trapped in their crevices, while cow parsley stands like a fence to guard the moment where time and water are one. And let me just come back. Thank you very much indeed. Um, thank, you. thank you for that hearing that. <laughs> thank you very much indeed. No, I was about five. And the soil in that area is, is, is ochre red. So everything looks like <laughs> Friends, I have to live up in the area, have a dog with white fur and it's got a red stomach from the water. <laughs> they call it road water red around there. Yeah. So thank you for listening and giving me the opportunity to share. Thank you. I hope you sleep well. <laughs> yeah, if I don't stay awake for the rest of the meeting, I hope you will accept my apologies in advance. <laughs> we will. Thanks. Okay. Thank you so, so much. Great to meet you all. Stephanie New is up next. And Stephanie is a poet from Marietta, Georgia. Currently based in New York City, she earned her degrees in symbolic systems and computer science from Stanford University. Her poems have appeared or are forthcoming in the Southeast Review, Storm Cellar, Midway Journal, and Portland Review. Stephanie. Um, thanks so much. Uh, yeah, I wanna echo what some of the other poets have said and that I'm just really grateful to be here. And I'm so excited that an event like this exists at all. Um, I love to see the worlds of science and of poetry unite. And so more things like this. Um, this poem is about the Chattahoochee River, which runs through my hometown of Georgia, uh, my hometown of Marietta, Georgia. Um, I was walking with a friend down a path that had no streetlights and it was nighttime and we were both a little bit spooked. And we heard this splash that sounded way too big to be uh, an animal or so we thought. Um, and that sort of led to this conversation um, that resulted in my thinking about how often in conservation we view um, humans and the natural world as these two maybe separate things and that it's often not so simple as just removing ourselves from the picture. Um, so this is To the Beaver's Eyes. It was only after hearing a hefty splash along the river at night, a sound so wide and juicy it would have been indecent if not terrifying, that I learned beavers are nocturnal. Imagine such elaborate construction at night, the careful whittling of branches to fit perfectly. Would the work not be easier in light? Beavers do not have good eyes. Of course, it is a trick of survival. The ones who learn to build by dark are not hunted by us. What other manner of life do we force into darkness? By the faint stars that night, each tree stump became a landmine. That splash not of malice, but likely fear or clumsiness. Perhaps it's silly to wonder if beavers miss seeing the world in light. 
what do we expect? Evolutionary memory, nostalgic genes? Which is better, to love the daytime or to live without knowing its touch? They don't choose. What does it mean when we say we hunters did it to survive too? Thank you. Thanks, Stephanie. I um, actually looked up, you know, whether we humans are really the cause of the beavers, you know, being nocturnal. And you're right, it's true. And I never, I never <laughs> knew that. It's kind of depressing too, but. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, thank you. Uh, our next reader is Diana Randolph from Drummond, Wisconsin. Diana lives in the midst of the Shawamigan Nicolay National Forest, not too far from the Namakagan River. She works in her home once in a blue moon studio, writing and painting. She also teaches art classes for adults currently online during the pandemic uh, through Wisconsin Indian Head Technical College. She enjoys silent sports, especially cross-country skiing, snowshoeing, running, and walking. She studied art at Northland College. She's the author of Beacons of Earth and Sky, Paintings and Poetry, Inspired by the Natural World, which was published by Savage Press. So Diana. Go ahead. Hello, everybody. Thank you for being here and this wonderful opportunity. Um, so this poem is inspired by a series of rivers in northern Wisconsin in my region. And what inspired me to start writing this was when there was a uh, mining proposal in the Pinocchi Mountain region. And luckily, the company withdrew. But um, at the time, I wrote this in kind of a protest and love of the natural world. This is called Knowing the Way. Headwaters of some rivers trickle in narrow channels while some gush freely from lakes hidden in these ancient hills. Rivers pulse over stones, boulders, golden grasses, splashing on embankments on their journeys, bending, twisting, following natural courses, knowing the way. Crystal clear water teeming with life, rippling to the great lake, flowing like the pure blood that runs through our veins, pulsing blood flowing forward, knowing the way, nudging us to breathe, to fill our minds and to speak with pure heart, nourished from the sources, life water, life blood. Thank you. That really resonates with that area. Thank you, Diana. All right. So next up we have Ron Ricky. Ron's books include My Ancestors Are Reindeer Herders and I Am Melting in Extinction from Apprentice House Press, Post Traumatic from Hoot and Waddle, and UP from Ghost Road Press. Reiki co-edited Undocumented from Michigan State University Press and The Many Lives of the Evil Dead from McFarland and edited, edited The Many Lives of It from McFarland and here, MSU Press, here, MSU Press Independent Publisher Book Award and The Way North from Wayne State University Press, a Michigan notable book. Ron. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you. Um, and uh, this, my poem's called It Took a Long Time to Discover. That what triggered me was night and dirt and the need to pee. My PTSD <laughs> counselor having me log every time my heart went crazy, every time my lungs refused to lung. How we went back months later and looked at all the times, drew lines, connected the stars, finding that I couldn't shower during the war that there were times we couldn't even urinate. So that just such a simple thing as doing that made me feel safe. How I love day because no one died in the day if, as if the day was for life. The wonderful honeysuckle that is life, its bounding prayers, 
and we discovered, aha, uh -huh, it was water that what cured me was water, that the war was really the absence of it, as if the earth had dried up and all that was left was a violent eczema. How she told me I should do things like put a photo of a river on my phone, open it, look down at its body, understand that I was 60% water, that I was looking at me, that peace was the headwaters, the source, the beginning of the river, the tributary. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. It was nice, nice that, <laughs> that you were able to get signed in and everything. <laughs> Appreciate that. Okay, our next writer is Daryl Ernest Tsai. He currently lives in South Korea and was born and raised in Saginaw, Michigan. He received an MA from Central Michigan University and an MFA from San Diego State University. He was a recipient of the J.L. Carroll Arnett Creative Writing Award. He was a guest poet at the Theater Rethke Memorial, where he ran a workshop for African American fathers and sons. His work has appeared in American Poetry Journal, Conundrum Engine, Catamaran Literary Reader, Santa Clara Review, Temenos, Third Coast, and Saw Palm, among other publications. Daryl. Hello. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome from South Korea. Uh, I'm going to read a poem called Ruse River. This poem, uh, it revolves around my grandmother's uh, neighborhood in southwest Detroit. Uh, zip, uh, yeah, zip code 48217. It's the most polluted area in Michigan. And in that neighborhood, uh, and my grandma's birthday is in a few days, which is nice too. <laughs> um, but in that neighborhood, uh, there's a river called Rouge River, and it's known to uh, be the most polluted river in Michigan also. Uh, and it's caught fire many times. And when I was young, my mother was driving me through that neighborhood, and I got to see the river on fire. And I was like, what is going on? So um, this poem explores uh, this phenomenon. <clears throat> Rouge River. You've never lived if your river hasn't been ignited with many wow. fires in winter. You've never tasted life if your neighborhood hasn't been hit by hydrofluoric acid fart let off by an oil refinery that burns the paint off your house. You do not understand those who live along the river of many fires. The water of their fosses sludges out in milky brown, lukewarm and edible richness. You who know nothing, tell the people to drink cause you've never seen the fires, ghostly blue. They dance atop the surface, refusing to drift downstream. You must see them first, if we are ever to be understood. That was really powerful. And I think especially for folks like us who are working to clean up places like that, you know, thank you. Yep. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> All right. So I believe our final poet is Lucy Terrell. Lucy sums her interests as nature, adventure, including mushing and canoeing and creativity like writing, sketching, photography, and quilting. After 16 years in Alaska, where she worked as research administrator and science communicator for Denali National Park and Preserve, she traded a big mountain for a big lake, Lake Superior, when she moved to Bayfield, Wisconsin. She holds a PhD in botany and ecology from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Lucy has published poems in a variety of journals and anthologies. She has published one chapbook, I Fly with Feathered Forelimbs in 2020, co-edits Aerial Anthology, and is Bayfield Poet Laureate from 2020 to 2021. 
Lucy. Oh, Lucy, you're on mute. How about that? There you are. Okay, thank you very much for being part of this group. I wanted to say a few words about this poem. Several threads seem to come together. I wrote it last August when I was participating in a postcard poetry challenge organized by Paul Nelson out of Seattle. Participants were grouped into uh, pods of 32 people. And during the month of August, we were supposed to write a poem a day on a postcard to the 31 other people on the list. So this was a poem that I wrote during August. And the reason that it refers to a river in the more West Midwest is that I tried to connect my poems to the person that I knew I was going to send it to. So the blue in the Missouri and Indian Creek are all near Kansas City, Missouri, where this particular person that I was writing the poem for lived. I also used William Stafford's book, Even in Wild Places, to be the prompts for my poems. So even though they were just a jumping off point, it helped to use this as the epigraph for the poem. And I also wanted to acknowledge that where I live near Bayfield is near the Red Cliff Reservation. So it makes it very clear that I live on lands that are ancestral lands of indigenous people and in particular Anishinaabe. So when I see the Red Cliff language camp listed on the map, I think of that and that's included in this poem as well. Talking water. They have trained the water to talk, William Stafford. The water remembers, tells of the path it once took, gurgles along Indian Creek to the blue and the Missouri, follows the St. Louis River to the slow and fecund estuary, follows the Raspberry River to Gichigami, passes the Red Cliff language camp where the culturally dispossessed have to learn the language they once knew in their bones. The way a river knows its banks and bends, its shining drops of life. Well, I figured I would cry once. <laughs> Thank you. All right. So if we could have a virtual round of applause, I'm gonna just do mine like this, it's easier. For all of those poets and all the <laughs> that we relate to rivers, we usually wrap up the river talk with questions or comments. And since this is a pretty large group, um, I noticed Barb Huberty, you have your hand up. I don't know if you're, have a question or comment that you were holding for a while. No, that was a mistake. I meant to be clapping. <laughs> <laughs> All right, there we go. Does anybody want to ask anything of any of the poets or any reflections from listening to those poems about river? Hey. You poets, how did you find this event? I just, I'm so impressed how widespread we all are. It's wonderful. Tom Hollenhorst is a dedicated researcher at the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, and they we posted it on Submittable, <laughs> which is the place where poets find things. <laughs> Any other comments? Marie, you got any thoughts? Oh, wait, there, Liz has got one. Go ahead, Liz. So I just think that this is wonderful to, um, at a time when people are spending more time outdoors and yet as a teacher, we can't get our students out 
in groups. Um, we can't really get them places. This is just a wonderful intersection to, to just cross pollinate all of their thoughts and their, their emotions. And, you know, we talk about social emotional learning and some of these are just so strong. I think about using um, the, the Memphis flood poem for, for climate change and just talking about that. And it just really resonates with me. I just think this is wonderful. Thank you. Go ahead, Sharon. Hi there, everybody. I was wondering if there are other opportunities like this that poets have found. And I am so impressed by what you delivered tonight. And I would tune in to, to things like this. I listened to Fisher Poets from Oregon Sea Grant uh, last weekend. There was a three-day Fisher Poets thing being, and it was an Oregon Sea Grant. It was, it was just the Fisher Poets of Oregon, I guess. That, uh, but I was wondering what other opportunities there might be like this. I want to turn that over to the poets because I'm curious about that too. Is a uh, science poetry writing a niche? Is this a thing that's happening? I know. Oh, but, oh sorry. Yes. I was just, mine's, a, mine's a one word response. Just submit to Canary. Just Canary. I just wanted to, if nobody's heard of it, but that's that's all I had to say about that. <laughs> it's just a great publication. Go ahead. Nice. Nice. Yeah, I know the Association for the Study of Literature and Environment is um, one of the first places I was uh, um, able to make connections with um, with scholars who are kind of cross pollinating a lot of these ideas. Um, the The journal they publish is ISLE IL, um, but the the conference that's biennial is the ASLE Association for Study of Literature and, and Environment. And um, I, I think that was one of the most, one of the first places I felt welcome as a poet among scientists, much like this experience. Um, it's so cool to have cross-pollination and I'd, I'd love to see it happen more often too. Me too. Me too. And that's why I'm just so impressed by what you guys have delivered tonight. I, I am serious when I said that I've been inspired. So thank you. And Amy? Yeah, I was, um, I was thinking one of um, what I like about this arrangement and what I meant early on about completing us is um, it's very clear people have thought deeply and analytically about many of these topics, but then a lot of times you just end up going down that rabbit hole of reasoning and we disconnect from our very humanity. You know, sometimes the very reason um, like I was telling uh, Marie, uh, it felt, feels like a million years ago, I uh, worked with, uh, for the National Wildlife Federation. And, you know, I still look back at it as a privilege to, to be part of everybody caring for the Great Lakes or trying to. Um, but it really, having grown up in Montana and having, you know, dryness and rivers of a different nature to come out here and see this abundance of water and see how people were trying so hard to find ways to share it and try and get back to the ways we've abused the rivers and the people around them. Um, I just think poetry and the arts uh, circles us back to those very best parts of ourselves that kind of restores us to go back out into the science and the stuff that, you know, uh, once you get too far in it, it you can lose sight of why you got so far down. I mean, I think I could still calculate a Tim Dull if I was really pushed hard, which is sort of scary. I raised my hand, so I'm gonna call on myself. <laughs> we just spent, um, you know, two and a half days really and talking about the St. Louis River and restoration projects and remediation projects and the social impacts of all of these things. and. Um, and one of the things that I really struggle with sometimes is that, um, you know, there's a bit of a disassociation from the meaning and from how it feels. And I just wanted to express my appreciation for poetry and for, um, for your poems in reconnecting with the feeling of water and the feeling of places and the feeling of rivers. 
because that's why I'm here, <laughs> right? Um, that's why I do the work I do. So, uh, and I think a lot of people um, who work on those places trying to um, trying to do do well by them. That's why we're there. So, thanks. Yeah, and I just wanted to to thank all the poets for sharing their gifts with us tonight. And you know, I think the thing that made these poems stand out from a lot of the others was they didn't just rhapsodize about um, the physical aspects of a river. They're, your poems like really internalized and personalized what the importance of water or the animals that depend on them uh, mean. And um, yeah, it was just really, it was just really, really fun um, reading all the poems and trying to <laughs> trying it was very hard too but you know trying to select out the ones for tonight so I just want to thank you for that go ahead Tom hey yeah well I was just thinking about Cam Davis's keynote yesterday and he talked about thinking like a watershed and uh, I thought it, it really resonated with me and thinking about the efforts we all bring to rivers and we're all these small little creeks that flow together to streams and streams flow together to big rivers and then to big lakes. It made me think a lot about Aldo Leopold's essay on thinking like a mountain <laughs> and finding that you know long term and, and thinking like a planet. Thank you very much for sharing your work. I just loved it. Go ahead Kate. Oh, Kate, you're on mute. I'm so sorry. Yeah, um, can you hear me now? Yes. Thank you. I wanted to thank you. I may be the only lone Brit. Um, I have visited America in the 80s. I've seen the Snake River Canyon. It went all around Wyoming, Montana and, and everywhere. So my sense of American landscape is shaped by that experience. But I've been very struck by how connected and rooted people are with their own area plus the the past that they see around them that's been really really interesting and I love the poem that where the gent used his own language to reflect as well I found that very powerful and particularly like the poem about St. The, the the polluted river St. Louis I found, found that really I was thinking of Erin Brockovich but you know not in a not in a silly way and working with psych patients, the poem about PTSD and people being 60% water um, and what's triggers. I know from doing night shifts that half my men can't sleep <laughs> or they sleep on the floor or under the bed. And again, it's those connected with experience. You wouldn't think a river would make you think of something you do every day, like work on a site board, but that's how everything interconnects. And that's why I've really enjoyed staying for the whole meeting. So thank you very, very much for having me here. <laughs> thank you. Go ahead, Hannah. Yeah, I just wanted to um, thank all of the poets. I, um, as a researcher, got to review all the poems and it was almost a transformative experience for me. And I wanted to echo what Deanna said a little bit about how Sometimes when we're data collectors, rivers become our specimens and we forget yeah. to connect ourselves to them and reading your poems and then especially hearing your performances tonight is just a great reminder how, you know, as scientists and researchers, we're allowed to step back and have a connection with our waterways to, um, you know, emotionally and that it's not just, it's not just numbers and data that we're after. It's about a place and a connection. So thank you all for your performances tonight. It's just wonderful. Go ahead, Lucy. First, I was um, struck by how much I liked individual poems, but then collectively how much more they were than just the sum of the individual poems. Mm -hmm. And that was great. And that made me wonder whether any thought has been given to try to put together a little chapbook of these poems, whether that might be possible. 
I'm not going to say I didn't think about it. <laughs> Marie's way more expert on that. I, I do performance poetry randomly and not professionally, but Marie is a writer. <laughs> um, doing them verbally is much easier than trying to get them published. But <laughs> Yeah, as we all know. <laughs> all the permissions and all that. But um, yes, it's something to think about. We'll, we'll discuss it. <laughs> All right. Well, it's very strange to be in a Zoom meeting with a bunch of people that you might never be in a room with again. <laughs> but um, thank you for being part of our St. Louis River community and for sharing your words and your thoughts. And um, one more round of applause for these really insightful poets. <laughs> Uh, thanks for coming to the River Talk. Our next River Talk, if you uh, like to talk about rivers, is on April 14th, and that is going to be focused on the brand new St. Louis River National Water Trail and getting out and exploring on the St. Louis River. So uh, same time, same place next month. <laughs> A little bit less poetry, probably. <laughs> Thanks for being here, you everyone. Might, you might this have started great. something you can't stop. You never know. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, they might all have poetry from here on out. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, you never know. You have a torrent of words you can't control. <laughs> Thank you again for having us and organizing. It was Thank you, everyone. The gift of an evening. Amazing job. <laughs> Thank you, Marie and Deanna and the tech guy. <laughs> <laughs> also known as Ryan. Bye bye, everyone. <laughs> bye. Thank you. Bye, Rebecca. Bye. Oh, we got a few hangers on here. I left there. Oops, I forgot they were on the meeting. Oh, we lost Marie too. Well, I'm going to go. That was a real long day. That was like so amazing. I'm just going to go lay on my bed. <laughs> Seems like a good plan. Go well, have a birthday, Ryan. You still got an hour. <laughs> and I'm on furlough tomorrow, so I won't hear from okay. many. Well planned furlough. Well done. Well done. All right. I'll see you later. Okay. Yeah.